Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Armen, Professor Armen Astvatsatrian from Yerevan, Armenia. And uh, you are on a Dr. Y channel, my dear friends, students, take your pens, papers, and let's go on. So we'll continue to talk about your last exams in the medical university, in the medical faculty, and today's questions are all around, all around, uh, neof uh, yeah, diabetic nephropathy. Mm -hmm. So take your pens, papers, have your seats, my friends, to make the notes. And of course, re-listening this video several times. Okay, what is diabetic nephropathy? Diabetic nephropathy is a glomerular sclerosis and fibrosis caused by metabolic and hemodynamic changes of diabetes mellitus. If it manifests as a slowly progressive albuminuria, with worsening hypertension and renal insufficiency. Diagnosis is based on history, physical examination, urine analysis, and urine albumin creatinine ratio. Treatment is a strict glucose control, angiotensin inhibition, or Zartans, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, and control of blood pressure and lipids. Okay, so question like this, I suppose answer like this is uh, okay. Maybe you can uh, just after that say that diabetic nephropathy is a very common symptom, asymptomatic until late and should be considered in all patients with diabetes. And periodically screen Ill all patients with diabetes with urinalysis and if proteinuria is absent, albumin creatinine ratio calculated from a mild morning urine specimen and treat blood pressure aggressively using beginning with angiotensin inhibition. Yeah, yes, on control, uh, control glucose to maintain glycolized, glycolized hemoglobin less than uh, 7.0. So, uh, my opinion is largely sufficient for, uh, for like an answer. Huh? But if the pay, if the members of jury insist to continue, okay, you have to continue. But what can I do? So diabetic nephropathy is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. Diabetic nephropathy is also the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the developing countries, accounting up to more than 80% cases. 80%. The prevalence of renal failure is uh, probably about roundish 40% among patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. And the prevalence of renal failure among patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus is usually stated around 30%, but this figure is probably quite low. Uh, interesting that renal failure is particularly common in certain ethnic groups such as black, uh, uh, Mexican-American, Latinos, Polynesian and uh, Pima Indian. So what can, we can consider that as a risk factor if you want. Uh, other risk factors are duration and degree of hyperglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cigarette smoking, of course. Certain polymorphisms affecting the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. Yes, there is a theory like this. Of course, family history of diabetic nephropathy or actually of something from uh, family history of uh, metabolic syndrome. And genetic variables, decreased number, number of glomeruli. So, cause type 2 diabetes is often present for several years, even decades before being recognized. Nephropathy of often develops less than 10 years after diabetes is diagnosed. And renal failure usually takes more, up to 10 years after the onset of nephropathy to develop. So uh, let's figure, fix, to, before we continue, let's fix nephrotic and nephrotic sy syndrome. It's like listening like the same, it's not the same. Huh? Two different conditions associated with malfunction and kidneys. So nephrotic and nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is characterized by increased permeability of the vascular wall of the glomeruli, which leads to the leakage of protein into the urine. 
The key symptoms is the presence of the large amount of protein in the urine, more than 3.5 grams per day, which leads to the development of edema, hypoalbuminuria, and hyperlipidemia. The cause of nephrotic syndrome can be kidney disease, such as diabetes nephropathy, minimal change uh, disease, amyloidosis of the kidneys, and others. Nephritic syndrome is associated with inflammatory process in the kidneys, which lead to malfunction of the kidneys. The key symptoms are the presence of protein and red blood cells in the urine, as well as increase in the level of creatinine in the blood. The cause of nephritic syndrome can be infectious, autoimmune disease such as systemic lupus erythematosus or glomerulonephritis, as well as certain medications. Thus, difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome lies in the causes and mechanisms of, other, of their development as well as the types of the changes that occur in the kidneys and which manifest themselves in different symptoms. But if you remark, there are a lot of uh, points that, that are similar. But anyway, we distinguish. Not we, huh? Nephro nephrologists, urologists. So... Uh, about pathophysiology of the diabetic nephropathy. Pathogen pathogenesis begins with small vessel disease. Pathophysiology is a complex involving glycosylation of proteins, hormonally influenced cytokine release, for example, transforming growth factor beta, deposition of mesangial matrix, and alteration of glomerular hemodynamics. Hyperfiltration and early functional abnormality is only a relative predictor for the development of renal failure. Hyperglycemia causes glycosylation of glomerular proteins, which may be responsible for mesangial cell proliferation and matrix expansion and vascular endothelial damage. Glomerular basement membrane classically becomes thickened. Lesions of diffuse of or nodular intercapillary glomerular sclerosis are distinctive. Areas of nodular glomerular sclerosis may be referred to as Kilmsteel Wilson lesions. Kilmsteel Wilson lesions. Yes, if you can re please huh? the number and number of lesion. Kimmel Steel Wilson. Kimmel Steel Wilson lesions. Thanks for assistance. There is a marked hyalinosis. Hyalinosis. No, hyalinosis. Hyalinosis. Of apparent and efferent arterioles, as well as arteriosclerosis, interstitial fibrosis, and tubular atrophy may be present. Only mesangial matrix expansion appears to correlate with progression to end stage renal disease. Diabetic nephropathy be, uh, begins as glomerular hyperfiltration, increased glomerular filtration rate, GFR, uh, famous GFR, it's increased glomerular filtration rate. So GFR normalizes with early renal injury and mild hypertension, which worsens over time. Microalbuminuria, yeah, Microalbuminuria, urinary ex excretion of albumin in a range of 30 to 300 mg albumin a day, then occurs. Urinary albumin in these concentrations is called microalbuminuria because detection of preterinuria by dipstick on routine urinalysis usually requires less than 300 mg albumin a day. Microalbuminuria progresses thus to microalbuminuria that is protein urea more than 300 mg a day at a at variable course, usually over years, sometimes decades. Nephrotic syndrome, protein urea. So actually nephrotic syndrome is a protein urea, more than three, up to three gram a day. Precedes end stage renal disease on average by about three to five years. But this timing is also highly variable. Uh, what else about pathophysiology? Other urinary tract abnormalities commonly occurring with diabetic nephropathy that may accelerate the decline of renal function include papillary necrosis, type 4 renal tubular acidosis, and urinary tract infection. 
In diabetic nephropathy, the kidney are usually of normal size or sometimes bigger, larger, more than 10 to 20, 12, 12, 10 to 12 centimeter in length, of course. Uh, symptoms, um, diabetic nephropathy is asymptomatic in early stages. Sustained microalbuminuria is the earliest warning sign. Hypertension and some measure of dependent edema eventually develop in the most uns untreated patients. In later stages, patients may develop symptoms and signs of uremia, for example, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, alia, that is with a higher glomerular filtration rate, GFR, than do patients with diabetic nephropathy. Possibly because the combination of end organ damage due to diabetes, for example, neuro neuropathy and renal failure, worsens symptoms of each other. Mm, diagnosis Early screening of patients with diabetes with random urine albumin creatinine ratio, urinalysis for signs of other renal disorders, uh, for example, hematuria, RBC. RBC is a red blood uh, cell uh, casts. The diagnosis is suspected in patients with diabetes who have proteinuria, particularly if they have diabetic retinopathy indicating small vessel disease or risk factors for diabetic nephropathy. Other renal disorders should be considered if they are on any of the following. For example, diabetic retinopathy, heavy proteinuria with only a brief history of diabetes, absence uh, of diabetic retinopathy, rapid onset of heavy proteinuria, gross hematuria, RBC casts, and rapid decline in glomerular filtration rate, small kidney size. Patients are tested for proteinuria by routine urinalysis. If proteinuria is present, testing for microalbuminuria is unnecessary because the patient already has microalbuminuria, suggestive diabetic renal disease. In patients without proteinuria or urinalysis or albumin creatinine ratio should be calculated for a mid-morning urine specimen, a ratio more than 30 mg a gram or more than 33.4 mg millimol, indicates microalbuminuria if it's present at, uh, on at least two to three specimens within three to six months and if it cannot be explained by infection or uh, exercise. Some experts recommend that microalbuminuria be measured from a 24-hour urine collection. But actually, good, uh, yes, I understand, good opinion, but this approach is less convenient and many patients have difficulty ac accurately collecting a specimen. The random urine albumin creatinine ratio overestimates 24-hour collection of microalbuminuria in up to 30% of patients uh, more than 65 due to, no, plus 65, 65 plus due to reduced creatinine production from reduced muscle mass. Inaccurate results occur in very muscular uh, patients if vigorous exercise proceeds urine collection. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can be, why not? For most patients with diabetes who have proteinuria, the diagnosis is clinical. Renal biopsy can confirm the diagnosis, but is rarely necessary. So about screenings. Patients with type 1 diabetes with, uh, without known renal disease should be screened from pro for, for proteinuria. And if proteinuria is absent or routine urinalysis for microalbuminuria beginning five years after diagnosis and at least annually thereafter. Patients with type 2 diabetes should be screened at the time of diagnosis and annually thereafter. And that's about prognosis. A prognosis is good for patients who are meticulously treated and monitored. Such care is often difficult in practice, however, and most patients slowly lose, slowly lose renal function, even prehypertension, blood pressure 
102 to 140 systolic and 80. 80 diastolic, mercury, uh, not to 90 mer diastolic, or stage 1 hypertension, blood pressure 140 to 160 systolic, and diastolic to uh, 100 mercury, may accelerate injury. Systemic atherosclerotic disease, a stroke, myocardial infarction, peripheral arterial disease, predicts an increase uh, in mortality, no, obviously. Management. Maintenance of glycosylate hemoglobin, uh, gold standard, less than 7.0. Aggressive blood, blood pressure control, beginning with angiotensin inhibition. So, uh, blood glucose control. Uh, primary treatment is street glucose control to maintain glycolyzed, glycosylated, glycosylated hemoglobin less than 7.0. Maintenance of euglycemia reduces microalbuminuria but may not retard disease progression once the diabetic nephropathy is well established. So we started. A blood pressure control. Glucose control must also be accompanied by strict control blood pressure, less than 130 80 mm uh, mercury. Although some experts now recommend blood pressure less than 140 uh, systolic, it's a good opinion. Some suggest should uh, some suggest should blood pressure should be 110 to 120 systolic and 65 to 80 mercury, particularly in patients with protein excretion more than one gram a day. However, others claim that blood pressure values less than 120 systolic and 85 diastolic mercury are associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and heart failure. So we have to understand that. Huh? Not to be a maniac to absolutely reduce the blood pressure lower than 120. It's inutile and may be dangerous. Okay, it's out of the topic, of course. Angiotensin inhibition is the first line therapy. Uh, this is a consensus about that. Thus, uh, AC inhibitors or Zartans, uh, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, are the anti hypertensive. IT hypertensives of choice, they reduce blood pressure and proteinuria and slow the progression of diabetic nephropathy. AC inhibitors are usually less expensive, but uh, Zartans can be used instead of in, instead if uh, AC inhibitors cause persistent cough. Yeah, of course, and no another option. No other possibilities, actually. Treatment should be started with Microalbuminuria is detected regardless of whether hypertension is present. Some experts, drugs, or some experts recommend uh, drugs be used even before signs of renal disease appear. So highly questionable, actually. Two points of view: diuretics are required by most patients in addition to angiotensin inhibition to reach target blood pressure level. Those should be decreased if symptoms. Uh, uh, or orthostatic, if symptoms of orthostatic hypertension, hypotension develop, or serum creatinine increased by more than 30%. About diltiazem and uh, verapamil, so non dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they are also anti, uh, anti proteinuric and, and renoprotective and can be used if proteinuria doesn't meaningfully decrease with an when target blood pressure is reached or as alternative for patients with, for example, for uh, with hyperkalemia or other contraindications to EC uh, inhibitors or Zartans. In contrast, dehydrobiridine calcium channel blockers, no famous nifidipine, felodipine, amlodipine, do not reduce proteinuria, although they are useful adjuncts for blood pressure control uh, and maybe the cardioprotective in combination with uh, AC inhibitors. AC inhibitors uh, and non dehydropyridine dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers have greater antiproteinuric and renoprotective effects when used together. And their antiproteinuric effect is enhanced by sodium restriction. Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers 
blockers should be used with caution in patients taking beta blockers because of the potential to worsen bradycardia. Actually, also questionable. Highly questionable. This lipidemia, uh, this lipidemia should be treated. No, statins, uh, actually, now we change our opinion about statins, but for the moment, statins are in the guidelines. So statins should be used as a first-line therapy, first-line therapy for this lipidemia treatment in patients with diabetic nephropathy because they reduce cardiovascular mortality and urinary protein. So far, it's like this opinion, but opinion changes. Uh, uh, other treatments, dietary protein restriction, highly questionable, yields mixed results. The American Diabetes Association recommended that people with diabetes and over nephropathy be restricted 0 0.8 to 1.2 protein kilogram a day. Significant protein restriction is not recommended. Actually, I'm not agree with this because anyway, we have only proteins, lipids and glucose uh, and carbohydrates in our nutrition plan so if this is a, the, <laughs> the diabetes mellitus no uh, glucose in our in our meal so and if no protein either what have to with what to eat finally and i don't think it's a uh, reasonable then supplementation uh, vitamin d supplementation cholecalciferol huh? Typically with cholecalciferol, vitamin D3. Yeah, why not? No, actually, also highly questionable. Sodium bicarbonate given to maintain and serum bicarbonate concentration more than 22 milliliters may slow disease progression in patients with chronic kidney disease and metabolic acidosis. And treatment for edema can include dietary sodium restriction, less than 2 gram a day, fluid restriction and loops diuretics as needed with with careful titration to avoid hypovolemia actually all that points are uh, highly questionable no and finally kidney transplantation with or with uh, without simultaneous or subsequent pancreas transplantation is an option for patients with end stage renal disease uh, five years survival rate for patients uh, with type 2 diabetes receiving a kidney transplant is almost 60% compared with 2% for dialysis dependent patients who do not undergo transplantation, though thus this statistic probably represents significant selection bias. And kidney allograft survival rate is more than 85% uh, after two years. No, of course, my friends, we can't answer on this question on the exams in this manner. Now, the beginning of this lecture is largely sufficient. But anyway, re-listening this video, my dear friends, several times, several times, uh, even podcasts, why not? Uh, if you don't want to see my handsome face, up to you. Uh, with your earrings, uh, up to you. Phones, huh? Okay. So that's largely enough. That's largely enough about uh, diabetic nephropathy. Uh... Don't forget to follow and subscribe the channel. God bless you and see you. Bye-bye. In another lectures, of course.